No matter how fast you go, there's always one thing you'll never be able to catch. Light. It's the fastest speed anything can travel in the universe, always staying the same. Whether we use a flashlight, look at the moon or sun, or measure a faraway galaxy billions of light years away, the speed of light never changes. When we gaze into the universe today, we see points of light against the vast, empty blackness of the sky, stars, galaxies, nebulae, and more. However, there was a time in the distant past, just before the Big Bang, when none of these entities had formed yet. At that moment, the universe was still filled with light. But where did this light, the inaugural light in the universe, originate? In 1965, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, working at Bell Labs in New Jersey, were trying to calibrate a new antenna for satellite communications. They noticed a constant noise in the sky, unrelated to the sun, stars, or the Milky Way. It was present day and night, and it appeared the same in all directions. After some confusion, they learned that a team in Princeton had predicted this radiation. It wasn't from Earth, the solar system, or our galaxy, but traced back to the early universe's hot, dense state, the Big Bang. Over the decades, precise measurements showed the radiation was not just above absolute zero, but had a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin, then 2.73 Kelvin, and finally, 2.725 Kelvin. The remarkable discovery confirmed the radiation's perfect blackbody spectrum, supporting the Big Bang theory and dismissing alternative ideas like reflected starlight or tired light scenarios. In more recent times, we've measured that the temperature of this radiation increases as we look farther back in time, determined by its absorption and interaction with clouds of gas along the way. As the universe expands, it cools down. So when we observe the past by looking at greater distances and higher redshifts, we're essentially seeing a smaller, denser, and hotter version of the universe. So where did this light, the first light in the universe, first come from? It didn't originate from stars as it predates their formation. It also wasn't emitted by atoms because it precedes the creation of neutral atoms in the universe. If we trace back to higher and higher energies, something intriguing emerges. According to Einstein's equation, these light quanta could interact with each other, leading to the spontaneous creation of particle-antiparticle pairs of matter and antimatter. Much like the collisions of protons at the Large Hadron Collider, which can generate numerous new particles and antiparticles due to their high energy, early in the universe, two photons had the potential to create a wide range of particles. Extrapolating from present observations, it's estimated that shortly after the Big Bang, there were about 10 to the power of 89 particle-antiparticle pairs in the observable universe. For those curious about the dominance of matter over antimatter today, a process must have favored the creation of slightly more particles than antiparticles, with a ratio of about one in a billion. This resulted in our observable universe having approximately 10 to the power of 80 matter particles and 10 to the power of 89 leftover photons. However, this doesn't explain the origin of all the initial matter, antimatter, and radiation in the universe. Addressing the conundrum of significant entropy, simply attributing it to the universe's starting conditions is unsatisfying. Yet, by examining solutions to unrelated problems like the horizon and flatness problems, a compelling answer to this mystery emerges. Something needed to happen to set up the initial conditions for the Big Bang, and that thing is cosmic inflation, or a period where the energy in the universe wasn't dominated by matter, or antimatter, or radiation, but rather by energy inherent to space itself, or an early super-intense form of dark energy. Of course, this is just a theory, but let's look at why it's a strong contender. Inflation played a crucial role in shaping the universe, stretching it flat and creating uniform conditions everywhere. It also drove away any existing particles or antiparticles and set the stage for the fluctuations that lead to overdensities and underdensities in our universe today. However, the key to understanding the origin of all the particles, antiparticles, and radiation lies in a simple fact. Inflation had to end to give rise to the universe we observe today. In terms of energy, inflation occurs as the universe slowly descends down a potential. When it finally reaches the valley below, 
inflation concludes, converting the stored energy from the elevated state into matter, antimatter, and radiation. This marks the transition to what we recognize as the hot Big Bang. As the universe expands and cools, it undergoes a remarkable journey, forming nuclei, neutral atoms, stars, galaxies, clusters, heavy elements, planets, organic molecules, and even life. Throughout this cosmic evolution, photons, remnants from the Big Bang, and echoes of the concluding inflation persistently traverse the universe. Though continuously cooling, these photons endure, never vanishing. Even when the last star eventually fades away, those photons, having long shifted into the radio spectrum and diluted to less than one per cubic kilometer, will still be present. Their abundance will remain as significant as it was trillions and quadrillions of years earlier. This narrative elucidates the origin and enduring nature of the first light in the universe, illustrating its evolution to its present state. Because the universe has been expanding over the 13.8 billion years from then until now, those earliest photons were stretched out, or redshifted, from ultraviolet and visible light into the microwave end of the spectrum. If you could see the universe with microwave eyes, you'd see that first blast of radiation in all directions, the universe celebrating its existence. After that first blast of light, everything was dark. There were no stars or galaxies, just enormous amounts of these primordial elements. At the beginning of these dark ages, the temperature of the entire universe was about 4,000 Kelvin. Compare that with the 2.7 Kelvin we see today. By the end of the dark ages, 150 million years later, the temperature was a more reasonable 60 Kelvin. Over the subsequent 850 million years, these elemental building blocks coalesced into colossal stars composed mainly of hydrogen and helium. Lacking heavier elements, these stars had the freedom to form with masses dozens or even hundreds of times that of our Sun. These celestial giants, known as Population 3 stars or the first stars, emerged approximately 560 million years after the Big Bang. Regrettably, our telescopes are not yet powerful enough to directly observe them. Astronomers estimate their existence indirectly. Eventually, these initial stars met their explosive end as supernovae, paving the way for the formation of even more massive stars that, too, detonated. The era of these stellar detonations, resembling a cosmic fireworks display, was so prolific and violent that it illuminated the entire universe during a period known as reionization. At that time, most of the universe transformed into hot plasma. In many ways, light is the simplest particle in the universe. Even though it always moves at the speed of light, it doesn't always move through completely empty space. As long as there's matter in the universe that's transparent to light, you won't be able to avoid slowing it down. But as soon as that light heads back into empty space again, it's back to the speed of light in a vacuum, with every photon moving as though it had never moved at any other speed at all. In our universe, certain fundamental rules govern all interactions. Energy, momentum, and angular momentum are always conserved when two particles interact. The physics of a system of particles moving forward in time remains the same when reflected in a mirror, with particles replaced by antiparticles and time reversed. Moreover, Every object in the universe is bound by an ultimate cosmic speed limit. Nothing can surpass the speed of light, and any object with mass cannot attain or exceed this limit. Over the years, ingenious schemes have been devised to explore ways around this cosmic speed limit. Theoretical concepts like tachyons have been introduced as hypothetical particles capable of exceeding light speed, but they are constrained by requiring imaginary masses and do not exist in reality. General relativity suggests that highly warped space might create shortcuts compared to the paths light must traverse, but no known wormholes exist in our physical universe. Although quantum entanglement can lead to spooky action at a distance, no information is transmitted faster than light. However, there is one way to surpass the speed of light. Enter any medium other than a perfect vacuum. This may sound strange, but let me explain. You see, light can be very weird. It is fundamentally an electromagnetic wave and exhibits both particle and wave-like behavior. In understanding its propagation speed, 
focusing on its nature as a wave, specifically an oscillating combination of electric and magnetic fields in phase, proves more beneficial. When traversing the vacuum of space, these fields encounter no hindrance, allowing them to travel with their natural amplitude, determined by the wave's energy, frequency, and wavelength, all interconnected. However, when light moves through a medium, any region containing electric charges or currents, these fields face resistance to their unrestricted propagation. While various properties of light can change in a medium, the frequency remains constant. As light transitions between a vacuum and a medium, or from one medium to another, its frequency remains unaltered. Nevertheless, since the speed of light is determined by the product of frequency and wavelength, the wavelength must change to maintain a constant frequency. Therefore, the speed of light adjusts as it propagates through different mediums. A striking illustration of the speed change of different wavelengths of light in a medium is the refraction observed when light passes through a prism. White light, such as sunlight, is composed of a continuous spectrum of wavelengths. Longer wavelengths, like red light, have lower frequencies, while shorter wavelengths, like blue light, have higher frequencies. In a vacuum, all wavelengths travel at the same speed, where the product of frequency and wavelength equals the speed of light. When this light passes through a dispersive medium, such as a prism, each wavelength responds uniquely. The electric and magnetic fields, carrying more energy for blue wavelengths, experience a greater effect from the medium. Although the frequency of all light remains constant, the higher energy light shortens its wavelength more significantly than lower energy light. Consequently, while all light slows down in a medium compared to a vacuum, red light experiences a slightly smaller reduction in speed than blue light. This phenomenon gives rise to captivating optical effects, like the separation of sunlight into different wavelengths, creating rainbows as it passes through water drops and droplets. In the vacuum of space, light has no alternative. It must travel at a single speed, regardless of its wavelength or frequency, the speed of light in a vacuum. This speed is also the limit for any form of pure radiation, including gravitational radiation, and is the velocity that any massless particle, according to the laws of relativity, must adhere to. However, the majority of particles in the universe possess mass, subjecting them to slightly different principles. For particles with mass, the speed of light in a vacuum remains an ultimate speed limit, but instead of being compelled to travel at this speed, it serves as a boundary they can never reach. They can only approach it. As you invest more energy into a massive particle, it can move closer to the speed of light, but it will always travel more slowly. The most energetic particles ever created on Earth, such as protons at the Large Hadron Collider, can approach an incredibly high velocity, about 299,792,455 meters per second. No matter how much energy we impart to these particles, we can only add more nines to the right of that decimal place, we can never actually attain the speed of light. To be more precise, we can never reach the speed of light in a vacuum. The ultimate cosmic speed limit, 299,792,458 meters per second, is unachievable for massive particles, yet it is the speed that all massless particles must adhere to. However, when traveling not through a vacuum but a medium, a different scenario unfolds. In a medium, the electric and magnetic fields of light experience the influence of the matter they pass through. Consequently, when light enters a medium, its speed undergoes an immediate change. This is why, when observing light entering or leaving a medium or transitioning between different mediums, it seems to bend. Unlike in a vacuum, where light propagates freely, its speed and wavelength in a medium are heavily influenced by the medium's properties. When high-energy particles move from a vacuum to a medium, they don't instantly change direction or lose energy like light does. The forces acting on them are not strong enough for an immediate impact. Instead, their trajectory changes gradually, and significant alterations usually occur through direct collisions with other particles in the medium. These collisions are crucial in particle physics experiments, helping us understand events and properties of nature, such as creating neutrino beams and studying antimatter particles in fixed target experiments. When particles move slower than light in a vacuum, but faster than light in a medium, they break the speed of light. This is the only way particles can exceed the speed of light. 
While they can't go faster than light in a vacuum, they can in a medium, leading to the emission of a special kind of radiation called Cherenkov radiation. Named after its discoverer, Pavel Cherenkov, this phenomenon was first observed when studying radioactive samples stored in water. The emitted light had a distinct blue glow and a preferred direction, unlike regular luminescence. Today, you can see this blue glow in the water tanks around nuclear reactors. But where does this radiation come from? When a fast particle moves through a medium, it can collide with the charged particles, electrons and atomic nuclei, in the medium. However, because atoms are mostly empty space, collisions are relatively infrequent over short distances. Instead, the fast particle influences the medium by causing its particles to polarize, like charges repel and opposite charges attract, in response to the passing charged particle. Once the fast particle moves away, the polarized electrons in the medium return to their normal state, emitting light in the process. This emitted light is predominantly blue and forms a cone-shaped pattern. The cone's geometry is determined by the speed of the particle and the speed of light in that particular medium. This property is crucial in particle physics, especially for detecting elusive neutrinos. Neutrinos rarely interact with matter, but when they do, they transfer their energy to a single particle. To capture this interaction, we use a large tank of pure liquid that's shielded from cosmic rays and other sources of contamination. The tank is surrounded by photomultiplier tubes that can detect a single photon. When a neutrino interacts with a particle in the tank, it produces Cherenkov radiation, provided the particle it interacts with exceeds the speed of light in the liquid. By analyzing the Cherenkov radiation and using large detectors, we can gather valuable information about each neutrino's properties, such as where it came from, when it interacted, and its direction. This technique helps scientists to study these elusive cosmic particles effectively. The discovery of Cherenkov radiation was groundbreaking, but it had an unintended and somewhat frightening use in early particle physics experiments. Physicists would close one eye and place their head in the path of a beam of energetic particles. If the beam was on, they'd see a flash of light caused by Cherenkov radiation in their eye, confirming the beam's activity. This risky practice was discontinued with the introduction of radiation safety training. Despite scientific progress, the only known way to surpass the speed of light is to find a medium where light slows down. This can only happen in a medium, and when it does, the distinct blue glow of Cherenkov radiation becomes a valuable source of information about the underlying interaction. Until futuristic concepts like warp drive or tachyons become reality, the Cherenkov glow remains the top method for exceeding the speed of light in a controlled setting. Over time, through various experiments, we've discovered something interesting about tiny particles called quanta. These particles act like both waves and particles at the same time, and what we see depends on how we choose to measure them. From what we can tell, there isn't one fixed and certain reality that exists on its own. Instead, it seems like the way we observe or interact with these particles plays a crucial role. In this universe, it turns out you have to observe things to figure out what they are. So when we conduct experiments and choose a way to measure these particles, it's like asking them, are you more of a wave or a particle right now? Surprisingly, the answer depends on how we ask the question. This concept challenges the idea that there's one fixed and certain reality for these particles. I always find it absolutely mind-bending to think that all around us in every direction is the first light from the universe. It's taken 13.8 billion years to reach us. And although we need microwave eyes actually to see it, it's there, everywhere. And that's it for the video. How can the entire universe come from absolutely nothing? Click the video up on your screen to watch it, and I'll see you there. Thanks for watching.